Hey, Dog Nation, I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Kroger. I hope that you're getting ready for a great weekend. I know that I'm excited about that, enjoying these remaining days of summer before the fall is here, and obviously we have a lot to look forward to with this upcoming football season. So we've got a lot to talk about today. I thought yesterday's show went really well. We went positive yesterday. We had some good news for Georgia. Why not do some of that again today? We'll have some of that off the very top of the program here today, too. Also, I'm going to make a kind of strange point, which I think is obviously true, although maybe not all that important. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, there's also some interesting stuff out there with uh, Walter Nolan right now, at least uh, something worth considering when it comes to the five-star defensive lineman. So we will do a lot of that. It is all on the way. A version of Jeff Sintel today. You'll get all kinds of new recruiting information from Jeff Sintel, but in a slightly different package than you're used to getting that. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Glad to have you with us as we do it. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Kroger. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Kroger. Fresh for everyone. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So I was joking with our video audience before the show began that, you know, yesterday we had some fun kind of keeping things positive. We looked at some really good news, I think, for the upcoming season for the Georgia offense. We talked about the trust that seems to have developed between Georgia coach Kirby Smart as quarterback JT Daniels, the praise from Pro Football Focus for Georgia's wide receivers. And as we said, Pro Football Focus is a trusted resource in moments when they're saying good things about Georgia players, it would seem. And the kind of dunce in the corner when they're saying bad things about Georgia players. That's just kind of the way that it seems to go for a lot of UGA fans. You kind of get the point and all of that. So as we kind of go to a Friday, and it's always nice to close out the uh, week on a positive note, as we head towards a Friday here, why not some more good news for UGA? With all of the precincts reporting, it certainly seems like Georgia looks like one of the real big winners, maybe the big winner, from the transfer portal off season, the sweepstakes of, hey, who can go out there and add all the, the, the big time players who can scoop all, the, you know, as many transfers up as you possibly can to fill in whatever holes you think you may have with your roster. When it's all said and done, it looks like Georgia's a, a pretty big winner in all of this. I'll give you some specific details as to why coming up in just a moment. But let me kind of just kind of think about this for a second before we get there. It's actually somewhat amazing if this is true, that Georgia helped itself during the transfer portal, because if anything, you know, to the, I think to the common thought out there, Georgia's one of those programs who the transfer portal is supposed to work against. I mean, let's face it, Georgia is one of the deepest rosters in all of college football, right? Just uh, one like percentage point below Alabama. You think about like blue chip ratio, which our buddy Bud Elliott does of the percentage of four and five star recruits on the roster. Georgia's what second in the country in that 79, 80 percent, somewhere along those lines. Uh, very, very high in terms of elite former recruits on the roster. If anything, I think a lot of folks envision the transfer portal market as being this thing where people take from Georgia's roster. They go and poach off Georgia's roster. They go shopping in the in the luxury department store and the elite, you know, Georgia talent that's not getting a chance to play as much as they want to it's supposed to be Georgia losing those guys in the transfer portal but even with Georgia already being among the deepest rosters in college football according to a lot of the folks who are now paying very close attention to this Georgia actually did as well in the transfer portal as virtually anybody did for those of you watching in video I'll show this on the screen and for if you're listening radio or podcast I'll read this to you and I think this is laid out in a very nice way our friends over 24 7 sports do some pretty cool stuff from time to time and this is an example of that they have a ranking of like you know best transfer players things uh whatever else but it's almost more interesting to me to look at it like this it's the all transfer team and they have an offense they have a defense and there are only two schools here who have three transfers on the all-transfer team in terms of a hey, guy at position making a big impact. Uh, Georgia has three of those. Oklahoma has three. We'll come back to Oklahoma here in just a moment. But for Georgia, you know who those three are. It's Eric Gilbert on the offensive side of the ball. It's Derek uh, Darian Kendrick and, of course, uh, Tyke Smith on the defensive side of the ball. So of the 22 players at the, you know, the, the positions across college football who are expected to make the biggest impact for the upcoming season, Georgia has three of those. So if you want one more reason to feel really good about Georgia for the upcoming season, as, as we've been saying, none of this guarantees a national championship or even an SEC championship or a trip to the college football playoff or anything like that. None of this guarantees that. 
But as you head towards the season, for the Georgia fan who wants to believe in his team, who wants to really you know feel feel good about his team, there's absolutely zero evidence out there that Georgia is anyway disqualified from the very top conversation in the sport. On the very shortest list of teams that win a national championship, there is no disqualifying aspect for Georgia whatsoever. They are deep in the mix, in the in the heart of that conversation for this upcoming year, and the, the success that Georgia has had in the transfer portal by virtue of what 24-7 sports points out there is kind of the uh, latest example of that. However, it also causes me to circle back around. It's kind of funny. The way we started the week seems really relevant for the way we're ending the week here on this Friday show. If you remember on Monday show, and I'll invite you to go back in and check it out if, if you missed it. We talked to John Stinchcomb about this, and we heard from Georgia defensive back, cornerback uh, Amir Speed on this, that there is this need, even with truly great elite talent, guys you recruited out of high school, guys you've developed over the course of the last couple of years, guys that just showed up here throughout the transfer portal, there is still something more important than just putting these very talented uh, players together like a jigsaw puzzle because, frankly, real life doesn't quite work that way. We've said this over and over again. It's worth repeating it here once again on a Friday that this is not fantasy football. This is real football. And real sports oftentimes don't work like fantasy sports where all that matters is how good your players are. In real life, good players also have to play well together. I'll just give you the brief example of what we've seen from USA basketball over the course of the uh, last couple of weeks. I watched the game against Nigeria the other night. It's actually kind of amazing to see, even though it's my own country, uh, not looking very good in, in the game against Nigeria. It's somewhat amazing to see the one team has all the better players, right? I mean, it's like, you know, the, the, the most famous, best players in the world all play for the United States, and yet in this particular game, it sort of looks like Nigeria. If the only thing you knew about basketball is what you're seeing from this one game, it sort of looks like Nigeria almost looks like the better team because there is something to be said for chemistry. There is something to be said for how well good players play together. And college football, to a lesser degree, because while Georgia's talented, it may not quite be talented as the United States basketball team, but you get the point here with all of this is that good players also have to, if you'll pardon bad grammar, good players have to play good together. And that is one of those things that obviously Georgia has awaiting it here this year. That's one of the reasons why coaching still matters in college football. Smart coaches who understand the dynamic of all of that and the fact that that's not a test you can cram for. You can't start in late August or September getting everybody on the same page, getting guys ready to go. It's one of those things that's important the entire way through. The entirety of the offseason, the full phase of the calendar year, bringing guys together, bonding them together so that when September rolls around, they are capable of playing together. And for as well as Georgia has done, already an elite, talented roster, couple of holes when it comes to the injury to George Pickens at wide receiver or the departure of defensive backs into the NFL draft. Georgia then goes and lands some of the top transfers in college football, as evidenced by what 24-7 Sports put out on social media. So Georgia clearly is good at filling its talent void when it needs to, in the rare instances when it actually has one. And also it seems to have the kind of coaching staff that can bring all these guys together in a cohesive fashion. And I think it'll be very interesting to see that play itself out. Then there's this. And I, th I think I said this on one of the other shows this week too. There are certain things that in a busy time of year, you just wouldn't even have time to talk about them on the show. But sometimes when we're in that kind of summer phase uh, ahead of the upcoming season, you do have the opportunity to just kind of notice things that seem somewhat curious. Can I see the, the, the tweet from 24-7 Sports on the screen once again? Because I think there's something kind of interesting here that, once again, the two schools that have three recruits on 24-7 Sports, not recruits, three transfers on 24-7 Sports all-transfer team, Georgia, where we mentioned, with Gilbert and Kendrick and Smith, and the other team that has three is Oklahoma. You've got Eric Gray, the uh, very impressive former uh, Tennessee running back. Wanya Morris, of course, a lot of folks know him from the Atlanta area. Uh, impressive offensive lineman now with the Sooners. Sooners also have a uh, defensive guy there as well, although I can't see that at the uh, moment. So they've got three guys on this list. And doesn't it seem like, and I'm not really quite sure what you do with this. It probably doesn't matter that much all the way around. But doesn't it seem like that... Georgia and Oklahoma, even though they've only played just one time in the Kirby Smart era and really just one time in kind of modern uh, college football history, but doesn't it seem like Georgia and Oklahoma are kind of always somewhat linked, linked here in terms of 
if you really want to believe in the Sooners as a national championship contender, adding Eric Gray at running back is a pretty big deal. I think most people think Gray puts up pretty big numbers. Obviously, Wanya Moore is a very talented offensive lineman. Say nothing of what they've added there on defense there as well. Much the same way, a lot of Georgia's national championship hopes kind of, I don't want to say fully hinge on what Gilbert and the, the two defensive backs do, but it's a, it's a big part of the component pieces of how well Georgia's going to be this season. And if that's true for Georgia right now heading into 2021, you remember what Kirk Herbstreit said at the end of the 2020 season when the college football playoff was announced and we found out who the four teams were that were going to be in. There's obviously a lot of time to fill in the broadcast leading up to that dis- to that announcement, and they're you know, just trying to keep eyeballs on the screen, so they're just kind of talking about whatever, f- filling in with whatever you want to fill in with. And a lot of you remember this. Kirk Kerbstreet on TV there that Sunday morning, that Sunday afternoon, saying, let me tell you this, the four college football, football teams, playoff teams may be whoever, whoever, but the two teams right now you don't want to play are Georgia and Oklahoma. He mentioned the way that Georgia was playing at the end of the season, the way that Oklahoma was playing at the end of the season. A lot of you know Georgia fans kind of took some pride in that. It's kind of nice to be mentioned in the forefront of the playoff conversation, even if Georgia wasn't actually going to be one of the final four from a year ago in an expanded playoff. They probably would have been in Oklahoma too, but in uh, – uh, a year of a four-team playoff. A lot of Georgia fans kind of enjoyed hearing the dogs mentioned in such a prominent fashion, and it was also being linked once again with Oklahoma. The same thing was true in 2018 as well. Remember, Georgia doesn't make the playoff. Herb Street, once again on television, had argued that Georgia should have been one of the four teams in the playoff after losing closely in the SEC championship game. And who went instead of Georgia? Well, in a lot of eyeballs, it was Oklahoma who got that spot that Herb Street and others had argued for Georgia to be deserving of. And of course, one of the great college football playoff games in the playoff era dating back to 2014 was the Rose Bowl on January 1st, 2018. At the end of the 2017 season, the Georgia-Oklahoma matchup there, I think one of the most memorable games in certainly recent UGA football history, if not all-time Georgia football history. And once again, it's a link between Georgia and the Sooners. So, as I said before, I'm not quite so sure that matters very much, and I'm not really quite so sure what a UGA fan's supposed to do with that, but these are two teams that have played once, and yet the conversation around college football has included the Dogs and the Sooners in the same sentence many, many times before. Great game in 2017, playoff comparison 2018, both two hot teams at the end of 2020, as evidenced by what Kirk Street himself said, and two teams who are national championship contenders who have used the transfer portal to bolster their case the 2021 season there as well. It certainly could be these two teams are destined for a remake or a rematch in this year's college football playoffs. Certainly it wouldn't be that strange of an occurrence if that took place. And obviously UGA fans are looking at the arrival of Eric Kilbert, the arrival of Derek, uh, Darian Kendrick, the arrival of Tyke Smith as a big reason why the dogs could indeed be in that conversation. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Kroger, and glad to have you with us no matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, our sort of, is it nascent voyage, is that the word I'm looking for here, the nascent voyage of broadcasting the show on DogNation.com, the soft opening, if you will. That seems to be going pretty well right now. You can watch the show at DogNation.com if you'd like to do just that. A whole bunch of fun stuff, a whole bunch of ways for you to catch up with the program, podcast, radio, on 960 The Ref as well. All kinds of ways to be a part of the show. We just really appreciate you being here. And, of course, as we start thinking about back to school, I want you to think about Kroger for a couple of reasons. First of all, they've got great savings on all your back to school needs. About crayons and books and backpacks, lunch boxes, the things to put in the lunch boxes, all the ways you can get going for the upcoming school season, the snacks and everything else. It's right there for you at your local Kroger. You can just stop by and see them in the store. Or you can go to Kroger.com slash school for more details on that. Kroger.com slash school for more details on that. While I've got your attention, let me also tell you about our Kroger 5-Star Kids promotion that's ongoing at DogNation.com. First of all, this is really cool, and you better believe my kids want one of these. They're going to be mad if I don't bring one of them home. If, you, if you're watching a video, you see this on the screen. This is our Dog Nation 5-Star Kids t-shirt. We're giving away, uh, there, let's, we'll go to the big camera for this one, uh, Dog Nation 5-Star Kids uh, t-shirt. We're giving away 50 of these right now, a random drawing as part of our Dog Nation Kroger 5-Star Kids promotion. If you go to dognation.com, you can find out more about our 5-Star Kids promotion. We're about to start announcing the winners here. You can also go to info at dognation.com to nominate your child or the child in your life that you know to be a winner here. In addition to the 50 folks who are going to win the Kroger 
Dog Nation Five Star Kids t-shirts. We've also got a collection of gift cards we're going to give to our Five Star Kid winners. We're going to do five of those coming up very soon. Let me read you off these gift cards just real quick because I think it's actually pretty amazing. It's a $100 gift card to Kroger, a $50 gift card to Domino's, a $50 gift card to Amazon, a $50 gift card to Dick Sporting Goods. It's $250 with the gift cards. It's amazing savings. Uh, really good stuff all the way around. Uh, and as I said before, in addition to the five winners of those gift card packs, we're also going to do 50 of these Kroger uh, Dog Nation Five Star Kid t-shirts. So dognation.com to find out more details or uh, info at dognation.com to make your nomination there. All right, let me give you a little bit of a house cleaning note about keeping note about what's about to happen on the show. So we are still going to do a on the road assisted by AAA with Jeff Sintel here coming up in just a moment. Jeff is actually on the road literally right now. He's on his way to vacation. So Jeff was good enough to spend some time with me yesterday on the subject of what's going to happen on July 22nd with uh, Branson Robinson and, and Deny Dennis Sutton. Jeff will give us his thoughts on that, uh, kind of a little bit of a deeper look at Dennis Sutton and Robinson, kind of what they bring to the table as players. Really good stuff. There's also a big date coming up this weekend for the IMG guys. Uh, I think about Dalen Everett and, and Keon Zab getting ready to make their announcement. The way I phrased this to Jeff yesterday was UGA at least a hat on the table, figuratively speaking, for these two guys. And Jeff will kind of give you a little bit more details on that about how much Georgia fans should even be paying attention to that as we head towards the weekend. So we'll do a good bit of recruiting talk with Jeff Sintel in a moment. The one thing you should just know, though, it's not a live interview. It's not me asking Jeff questions in the moment and answering them. I interviewed him yesterday. I'm going to play the clips for you coming up in a moment, but it's all fresh and new information. We just did it yet last night, so we're all pretty good on that front. Before we get there, I, I do want to give you a little bit of a note here as we go around the doghouse with five-star defensive tackle uh, Walter Nolan. So Saturday Down South writes a story about Nolan based on an interview that Nolan's father did with one of those like fan-sided sites from Sports Illustrated, but these are real quotes from from uh, from Nolan's dad. And it gives a little bit of insight in where the Nolan camp thinks about the situation with his group of finalists. He had his top five put out recently. So I wanted to read you a couple of brief sentences on that just to kind of give you the, uh, the, the, the facts on all of this, I guess, as it stands right now. As far as the way that, that Nolan and his family feel about Georgia right now, this is what Nolan's father uh, told the fan side at Florida side that uh, Saturday Down South has uh, shared the quotes from. If you want to follow like kind of the blockchain of how this gets to um to in, into my uh, field of vision, so this is what Nolan's dad says about Georgia. He says Coach Trey Scott is one of the best recruiters. Uh, Georgia has a good body of work, also meaning success on the field. He says, and this is interesting from uh, from uh, Nolan's camp on uh, Nolan that they uh, that they haven't gotten over the hill yet, meaning Georgia, which I guess their Achilles' heel is Alabama. But Georgia, he says, has a good program, and they have a good recruiting staff too. As far as the feelings from Nolan and his family on Alabama, uh, Nolan's father says Bama is Bama. All of that work speaks for itself. So much the same way for the class of 2021, Alabama essentially just sold its prestige as a way of winning with big-time recruits, in many cases recruits that couldn't even take – visits to campus think about dallas turner and, and guys like that uh in the case of nolan also once again that bama prestige seems to be you know kind of paying off uh, a little bit there on that uh also in interesting stuff on florida from uh from walter nolan's father here the five-star defensive lineman saying i think that dan mullen is probably the biggest factor for florida you don't hear that said very much but in this case uh mullen seems to be paying some dividends for the uh, recruitment of Nolan here. He says, to be honest with you, I can't even remember whose Florida's coach was before he got there, which is, <laughs> I guess, a little bit of a ding against uh, Will Muschamp. He says that Florida has a good coaching staff. Uh, David Turner's a good coach. Uh, we enjoy talking with them. Dan Mullen is a good guy. It feels like home down there as well. He says that the uh, decision could be coming sooner rather than later there too. So a little bit of an update from uh, Walter Nolan, the five-star uh, defensive tackle. Georgia seemingly square in the mix in all of this. And for some folks who've kind of wondered who that chief competition is, you hear some uh, talk there about Florida, obviously the Alabama prestige. And then you've got I guess, you know, Tennessee, Michigan in the mix in some form or fashion there as well. So interesting update on what has been a pretty wild recruitment here involving the five-star defensive tackle, Walter Nolan. Before we move on, we'll do On the Road Assists by AAA. Can I do a couple of quick shout-outs here? Because i got a couple of great uh, uh, tweets coming in the last couple of days. There is nothing that makes me happier than knowing that all of you are enjoying some of the products we tell you about here on the show. So a couple of quick shout-out here 
Raiders. Shout outs here to those of you who have been trying to finish long drink lately. Kyle Garner reaches out to say he got some on vacation. He says, as a wise man once said, you got to support the businesses that support the dogs. He says, and it's tasty to boot. So, Kyle, glad to hear that you're enjoying the finished long drink, that ready to drink cocktail that comes delicious right out of the can, mixed drink uh, with a great liquor kick and a citrus flavor. Also, uh, S Highland 23 reaches out to say that he's in uh, Petaluma, California, enjoying the long drink strong. That's a, a good thing there in the uh, black can eight and a half percent alcohol by volume so big thanks to all of you who are enjoying that finished long drink and don't forget if you check out the long drink.com you can find out just like our friends on twitter did there where you can pick that up today and enjoy yourself some as you head towards the rest of the summer they're going to be with us for dog nation invasion coming up there as well in charlotte in the month of september so we'll all get a chance to try it there as we head towards the uh, queen city for that one between the dogs and the clemson tigers before we're done on today's show, a former UGA wide receiver has a brand new home. And I think this is a very interesting development for the upcoming season for one of those teams that could be a little bit of a fly in the ointment for uh, a, a lot of the uh, programs out there in college football. So we'll talk about that before we're done. But for now, for everything on the big date for Georgia on July 22nd with Branson Robinson at the 9 and the Sutton, and for a little bit of an update on some recruiting news that may unfold here this weekend. Let's do all of that with Jeff Sintel right now as we go on the road, assisted by AAA. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So this is normally the portion of the time on the show where I'd say hello to Jeff Sintel. We'd have a live interview and we would do pretty much what we've been doing on this show now for what, more than five years going on six years of talking recruiting here on a friday on our program on the road assisted by triple a jeff literally is on the road today he's on his way to vacation so jeff and i spent a little bit of time together last night and this is i think is a good update on kind of where things stand with uga recruiting as jeff gets ready to say goodbye to us for a few days i started our conversation this way by simply asking Jeff what his overarching thoughts were, setting the stage for next Thursday, July 22nd, with two big commitment announcements, two big possibilities for Georgia to add uh, elite names for the 2022 class, what Jeff's thoughts were about that date going into next week. I thought Jeff gave us some good insight. Take a listen to this. It sounds very much like a Kirby Smart stage thing, right? You know, 2022, boss moves, two big guys, uh, Boss Moves 22 on the 22nd. A lot of wild twos. That'd be like a really great poker hand maybe. But, um, you know, this is, it, at least the Branson Robinson decision is based on the, the death of a family member, his uncle, who, who, meant, who meant a great deal to him and still means a great deal to him in terms of a, a galvanizing force to succeed in Branson Robinson's life. Uh, he was slain by a shooter's bullet. Uh, and this is his uncle's birthday. And uh, the hashtag LLB means something to Branson Robinson, and that's why on July 22nd, that's his day. And it just so happens, you know, I talked to Denai Dennis Sutton about it, and he's like, man, it's just a day for me that made sense. He said he wanted to do it around this time. He wanted to do it um, in July. And uh, it, it just kind of comes together. Like, you know, Brandon, there's a story on the, on the website, and it's going to be – I thought it was really interesting how those, those two guys – met uh, for the first time at Georgia, and Brandon, we all know about Branson Robinson, and we thought he was the most chiseled and rocked out dude uh, imaginable in any recruiting class, but I tell you what, you look at Denai Dennis Sutton, and it looks like Denai Dennis Sutton doesn't skip leg day or arm day or fat pies, glutes, last day, or anything else like that self, and you know, those two guys, it's funny, they're linked together on their commitment day, potentially potentially to one school because both of them have Alabama and Georgia uh, in their in their final groups. Uh, but then they but then they visited together for the official visits to Georgia and then they came right around two weeks later and visited together on their official visits to Alabama. So those two guys, they do know each other very well. Yeah, so he talks about the relationship, the connection that uh, that um, denied in a son and Branson Ron and developed with each other. Obviously, we think about those two guys as being linked. Uh, Robinson, the running back, uh, Dennis Sutton, the you know kind of hybrid style defensive lineman because they're announcing the same date. And I guess behind the scenes, they have started to connect a little closer together with each other as well, which I think overall is, is certainly pretty interesting. As far as a little deeper look here denied Dennis Sutton, I think one of the interesting things about Dennis Sutton is 
exactly the position fit that he has at Georgia. He's listed as a defensive lineman. He's about 250 pounds right now. So, you know, does that mean defensive end in a 3-4, maybe adding a little bit of weight? Does that mean, you know, changing over, becoming a little bit more of a true outside linebacker? Does that make him more suited for a 4-3 for, for a type system? You know, I asked Jeff Sintel a little bit more about this to, to give us a little bit of a, of a player description for Denied in a Sutton, player comparisons that you could make, how you think that position works out at a place like Georgia. And Jeff was good enough to go into a little bit more detail about exactly what kind of player Denied Dennis Sutton would be the uh, the uh, defensive lineman here if he chooses the University of Georgia. Here's a little bit more from Jeff on that. I think the name to me that pops for 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 DDS is Tra- Trayvon Walker, and you know how Trayvon Walker is kind of a do it all athlete, a basketball player. Dennis Sutton is too. Uh, where Trayvon kind of leaned towards the defensive end, defensive tackle, defensive lineman side. Well, I think Denai Dennis Sutton leans towards the the outside linebacker side. He's a, he's a straight up defensive end in his high school scheme. That's what Penn State thinks he can play and believes he will play. But then Georgia and Alabama both see him, see him as an outside linebacker, a guy that can play in space uh, and play with his hand to ground. And, you know, Dennis Sutton, you know, he, he changes a lot of norms for me, Brandon, because, you know, I, I kind of thought about this the other day and I probably talked to like, 50 high school kids a month. I really get to know their stories, their how they work, what makes them tick. And I don't know if I've ever ever come across a young man. Maybe it's just the year 2021. I don't know if I've ever came across a young man that stresses his mental clarity, his mental focus, clearing his mind, going on long walks, meditating every day as a as a mechanism for him to be successful and to pursue what he wants to do with his in his life with his dreams with such vigor. I don't know if I've ever came across an athlete that, that prioritizes that so much as denied Dennis Sutton. And then the other norm for me, Brandon, is crazy, is, you know, I, I see a kid that's 260 in high school and defensive and outside linebackers in the conversation. You just naturally assume that kid's going to put on 20, 30 pounds by the time he gets to college or his first year of college, and he's going to be a defensive lineman. He's going to be an interior defensive lineman, maybe a five-tech. But with Denai Dennis Sutton, it's a little different, man. He he watches his weight. He's kind of stayed between, like, 240 and 260 for about a couple of years now. He doesn't need pizza. His coach, Hakeem Soule, told me he was they were hanging out. He's like, hey, man, you want a slice of pizza? And get this, man, what high school deep football player says, no, nah, man, I can't eat that. That's got way too many carbs. I mean, this is a guy – this is a guy, Brandon. I mean, he's just got himself figured out already. We we had his interview, we had his audio on before the hedges on Wednesday night, and most of the the Dog Nation viewership was saying this guy sounds like he is in a college senior or or he's in the NFL. There's no way he sounds like a high school kid. That's how mature and composed he is right now. I think that's really interesting from Jeff Sintel on the personality that that, uh, Dennis Sutton brings to the table, very similar to some of the other recruits we've talked about thus far for the class of 2022. If I could describe a defining characteristic for most of the names we've discussed, whether it be UGA recruiting targets or outright commits, there is a level of maturity this class seems to possess that I think has impressed more Georgia fans. The running back target, Branson Robinson, is an example of that too. We'll let you hear some of Jeff's thoughts on where things stand with Robinson. In particular, the question that I'm going to ask to Jeff in a moment is, is it really going to be this easy for Robinson? Robinson has not had a lot of plot twists. There haven't been a lot of attempts to swerve people. He has been open about his feelings about Georgia for quite some time. Is it really going to be that easy of a walk up to the finish line in Robinson's recruitment? We'll tell you what Jeff said about that coming up in a moment. Before that, let me remind you, this is a version of On the Road, uh, assisted by AAA with Jeff Sintel here today. Jeff truly on the road, on his way towards vacation. So we're getting some of his recruiting thoughts from a conversation that I had with him uh, just last night. And, of course, as we do that, I'll remind you that it's all presented by our friends at AAA. You know, when you think about AAA, you think about roadside assistance. And if you're driving to vacation here this year, that's a good thing to know you have Uh, to help you out if something were to go wrong while you're on the road. But I also want you to think about AAA for that thing that you put on the road, that vehicle that you drive, because when you switch and save your auto insurance with AAA, you can save on average $529. That's money that matters, and it's money that can come to you via AAA uh, when you switch and save with them today for your auto insurance. Check out the website. It's aaa.com slash auto insurance. That's AAA.com 
slash auto insurance. You can find out why so many in this audience here on Dog Nation Daily has switched and saved with AAA for their auto insurance. All right, so as promised, Jeff Sintel on the subject of Branson Robinson and the fact that Robinson hasn't been shy about talking about his love for the Bulldogs and UGA fans haven't really been too shy about expressing their optimism that next Thursday, Branson Robinson indeed will make that public pledge to UGA. Recruiting battles are notoriously difficult to predict. This one doesn't quite seem to be so difficult to predict. What does Jeff think about that? He told me this yesterday. And this is one of those guys, I guess this, this would feel like a golf tournament maybe where the guy's shooting five under every, five or six under every, after every 18 holes and you just know it's an eventuality. eventuality. That's kind of what it feels like. I mean, Branson, Branson, you know, no, I, I hope nobody in this industry would do that, but Branson's the type of guy that you could call him up on the day before his decision and he would say, yeah, man, Georgia still leaves. And, and he wouldn't think anything of it. I mean, he would say, this school leaves or whatever. I mean, he would just be like, it's just kind of been for the longest time. He's been feeling Georgia, Brandon, all these. I mean, we've been talking about Branson Robinson and all the signs from his teammates and the, the Power G, the Nick Chubb 2.0, the Zeus nickname, uh, the Herschel Walker documentary, the fact he didn't want to leave Georgia on his official visit. Um, I mean, this has almost seemed like, I don't know, maybe let me let me drop a Game of Thrones reference in here, Brandon, where this was a prearranged marriage for many, many years and you just had to get to the get to the certain point when it was time for it to finally be, I guess it finally be announced. That's what it sort of feels like where – this is a different commitment, Walt, for a guy that's just kind of seen match made in heaven with Georgia for quite some time now. It's almost like I'd use a slightly different analogy for all of this. You know, it used to be that, like, we were in the age of, like, movie trailers. I think trailers still kind of matter, but I remember, you know, it used to be that sometimes the movie trailer would show you the whole movie, and the only thing that was left to experience actually watching the full 90-minute uh, hour 20 minute ver you know version of this that that that's kind of what the movie trailer you know gave you it gave you the beginning it gave you the middle it gave you the end there wasn't a lot of mystery but the trailer was so good you still wanted to watch the movie anyway and I think that's a lot of the ways in which Branson's Robin Branson Robinson's recruitment has played out if it truly is this easy to predict Robinson to UGA I don't think dog fans are bothered by the lack of mystery here I think they still want to follow this all the way to the uh, to the commitment date. And if if Robinson, the elite running back, very impressive prospect that he is, if he truly does name Georgia on Thursday, I think dog fans themselves are going to be just as happy about that as they would be if it was one of those surprise announcements that seemingly comes out of nowhere. The lack of intrigue for this one, in other words, Branson Robinson, if it indeed does play itself out that way, does not seem to be doing anything to to lessen the enthusiasm that Georgia fans have for this recruitment. Of course, as I mentioned, July 22nd looms as a big day with the Nye Dennis Sutton and Branson Robinson both making their announcement. But there's also some of a big uh, thing here this weekend there as, as well, as a handful of the IMG Academy guys are also slated to make their college commitment. And a couple of those are situations where Georgia would at least be thought to have a hat on the table. By no means a favorite, and my assumption is Georgia doesn't get either of these commitments, but it's at least worth asking Jeff about it. Dalen Everett, who we talked about uh, the other day, defensive back, Keon Sabs, you know, safety there as well. A couple of players that throughout the process Georgia has been somewhat linked with. I guess there's uh, you know, still you know, maybe some reason to believe that Georgia's at least if you want to use the same phrase again, a hat on the table in these recruitments. But ahead of this July 17th date, decision date for these guys, is there any reason at all for Georgia fans to be paying any attention to this whatsoever? Once again, Jeff Sintel talked a little bit about that. Take a listen to this. It's one of those things now, and I don't, I don't know if both of those decisions are in. There were some big conversations this week between uh, the staff, Georgia staff, and the staff of a lot of, a lot of schools with those two guys. And, it sounds like this is a get it done week for ING Academy because you almost expected Tyler Booker to make his announcement and Kamari Wilson to make their announcements because you have Catron Fat Man Allen on Friday making his decision. You have Keon Sab, you have David Everett. Uh, I think we've coined a phrase where, you know, Georgia's recruited a couple of those guys really hard and they looked in great shape with those guys at one point or maybe they gave, uh, they gave you know, a Clemson or a North Carolina, the run for the money on a couple of those guys. But, you know, hat on the table, 
maybe it's a little bit more than I had on the table. Maybe it's the, the silver or bronze medalist, Brandon. But I know, uh, I know you take no solace in being on the podium when it comes to a five star and a, a, a an elite prospect. Maybe not choosing Georgia. So I think that's honest. You know, it is a story worth following because Georgia's at least a little bit in the mix here. But you know, the one thing that we're not going to do, at least on this show, I'm not going to do, and I don't think Jeff would ever do this either. In fact, I know that he wouldn't. Is exaggerate you know, the, the chances of Georgia getting a recruit that it doesn't appear they're going to get. In the case of Sab and Everett, both really good recruits, it certainly does not seem like right now that's the direction all of this is going. But how about a final thought here for a moment from Jeff before we hear from him? It'll be a few days before we get a chance to check back in with him. He is going to be on vacation here. Everything as far as where it stands for Georgia with the 2022 class right now, we clearly know, and we've said this, that July 22nd is going to be a big date for the dogs. And kind of how does all of that fit into the big picture? Once again, Jeff Sintel was good enough to share his thoughts. This is the time when uh, a guy like me gets on vacation because it's about the only time it could happen. And he wonders, well, that, that means the commitments are coming because, you know, guys in the industry are going on vacation. So, I mean, it's that time of year. You know, Georgia, it, it, it sounds crazy, Brandon. So many people have been looking to the early announcements in July, which now feels like commitment season. And – Everybody's forgetting there's going to be an open period or at least a period, a quiet period where recruits can come back on campus uh, in the month of July. I think it's going to be an integral uh, visit for Oscar Delt to Clemson to see if Clemson can kind of kind of shake the tree a little bit on that recruitment as well. You know, they can get in the mix with a couple other major players. But, um, you know, for me, this is just a different recruiting cycle. Different things have happened because – we're not used to the parameters of these kids taking their official visits. Now you're going to have another rush in August where if the guys don't commit in July, try to commit in August before their senior year. A lot of names. You know, is Travis Shaw going to go, go the distance? Jamar Stewart, Walter Nolan, Andre Green Jr. You know, the, the focus will shift um, even if it feels like Georgia hasn't got a commitment in ages. You look at the 24-7 sports team rankings, they're ninth when all of us, for, for me and Brandon, what was it, the beginning of June, they're all, and they held the number one class in 2022 and 2023 simultaneously. I think everybody's just ready to hear some good news again. Indeed, ready to hear some good news. And the bottom line on all of this is July 22nd, this upcoming Thursday, may be that day where Georgia wins at least one big commitment, could win two as running back Branson Robinson and defensive lineman to die Dennis Sutton. Get ready to make their announcements. Good stuff from Jeff Sintel on that as we go on the road with him, assisted by AAA, just ahead of his vacation, him sharing some thoughts on UGA recruiting, and I'm glad he was able to provide that insight. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. So interesting stuff all the way around there from Jeff Sintel, and you know certainly all eyes for Georgia do seem to point towards Thursday. The big commitment decisions come down. Next week's actually going to be a really busy week. Many of you are aware of this. Leading into what's going to happen with the recruiting front on Thursday, it's SEC Media Days. We'll have SEC Country Live, live from Hoover, Alabama on Wednesday. Of course, the Georgia Day for uh, SEC Media Days on Tuesday. There'll be big-time coverage of all of that from Dog Nation. I think it's fair to say we'll go wall-to-wall. I never really know what the media entities mean when they say they're going wall-to-wall with coverage. But but uh, whatever wall-to-wall is, it certainly sounds like we have wall-to-wall coverage coming from not just what the Georgia guys say next week at SEC Media Days, but what all the other coaches and players say about Georgia if and when they do say something about the dogs. That's all going down next week for SEC Media Days. And, of course, big recruiting day for us on Thursday. A lot of video planned for the decisions for Denied in the Sutton and Branson Robinson. We'll be all over that there as well. As we transition our SEC through, let me also say this for a moment. I know as you head towards the upcoming school year, many of you heading toward, or you have children, family members, whatever else, heading towards college for the first time. One of the big questions you always face is, you know, how are we going to pay for the, uh, the, the college experience? That's one of the things that my friends at College Avenue can do for you. Uh, last minute help to potentially cover some of those college exper- expenses you might have. I'm talking about private student loans from College Avenue. Uh, they can cover the full cost of college, uh, competitive interest rates, flexible repayment plans. That's certainly a great thing. Uh, great customer service was always really important on all that, too. It's a quick, stress-free, it takes just three minutes to apply here. So great way to get in touch with College Avenue and get some of those last-minute college expenses taken care of, competitive interest rate. They're going to take really good care of you. If you go to College 
I'm gonna call it's College AVE. I think College Avenue here. The word College AVE.com. College AVE.com. And you can find out the interest rate that you can get, the repayment plan that you can get. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be something made for you to match your budget. So make sure you check them out today. That's collegeave.com for a lot more on that. SEC through time here now. And that was very interesting yesterday. Dan Wolken from USA Today reporting. This has essentially been backed up by the reporters now, too. Then in a conversation with Mark Emmert, the NCAA commissioner, I guess you call him, uh, president maybe, whatever his title is, the leader of the NCAA, that sounds like he's now ready to relinquish some of the power that comes with that position and more of the decision-making for college athletics will now be made by conference commissioners. And the obviously the SEC in particular uh, would seem to benefit from this when you look at how instrumental the SEC was in saving the college football season a year ago when – it looked like for a while all of the momentum was moving towards a complete cancellation of the season. And leagues, the SEC wasn't the only one. You'll give the ACC credit for some of this too. Uh, but leagues like the SEC were able to pump the brakes on this and save the season, get the games taking place there in the fall. And the rest of the sport kind of followed suit. Most of the rest of the sport followed suit in, in the aftermath of that. Of course, since all of that, there's even been more interesting twists and turns with the NCAA the loss in front of the Supreme Court, the rise of name, image, likeness, the transfer portal, everything else, the decision-making process for college sports moving forward, not just football, but all the sports, may be less centralized at the NCAA level and handled more by the various conference commissioners. Now, for some people, they're not going to like this because some people, look, there are just some people in life who like the idea of central planning. They just, they just live for that kind of thing. And there are some people who want a little bit more of a central planning type, you know, attitude for college sports, a little bit more uniformity in decision-making. That's never been something that I've had. A, it's, it's never really bothered me that, that conferences kind of move at their own whims. You know, the fact of the matter is different regions of the country have different values, different, you know, different things are important. So various conferences taking slightly different tax towards things and then coming together when it, when it matters to say organize a college football playoff or something like that. That seems to me a fairly sensible thing. The truth is, sometimes I don't like the way that Greg Sankey makes decisions within the SEC. I think some of his decisions within the league have been worthy of criticism. But when Sankey represents the SEC outside the league, I tend to think he does a fairly good job in, in that regard. So if the move away from NCAA-controlled power towards more conference-controlled power, if that does indeed happen... I think for college sports, in, in a roundabout way, it probably ends up being a slightly good thing. Addison Nichols is an elite four-star offensive lineman, and in light of what we were just saying about Dalen Edward and, uh, and Keon Sab, important to note that Nichols this week came out with his top three. He had Ohio State in there. He had Tennessee in there, and he had North Carolina in there as well. And you know, Nichols was a guy, I guess, at one point in time that uh, was kicking the tires on Georgia, Georgia kicking the tires on him, but as he moves towards his list of finalists, looks like that's not going to be a thing here. I do want to just say this really briefly. I think this is kind of interesting. So when Kansas hires Les Miles, seems like kind of a retread hire of a guy that once won a national championship. There are a lot of people who thought, I'm not, I'm not really quite so sure how that works out. But the same thing would have been said when UNC rehired Mac Brown. Many of you remember Brown was head coach at North Carolina before he went to Texas. Once again, this is kind of a retread hire from a coach who won a national championship quite, so long, uh, quite a long time ago. Not a young man by any stretch of the imagination. And it would, it would have been very easy. In fact, it was easy. Most of us probably did say similar things about UNC hiring Brown that were said about Kansas hiring last mile. And here we are, you know, all these however many months later, and think about how different these two hirings seem to have gone. Miles is out in shame at Kansas, and his entire reputation as a coach is tarnished forever because of what's happened to him here recently. And yet, Mac Brown has North Carolina looking like a major player on the scene. Now, listen, a lot of the recruits that we connect them to right now are just that. These are recruitments that UNC is involved with it remains to be seen how many of these recruiting battles they're truly going to win they could win with Everett over the weekend they might not that might end up being Clemson same thing for Addison Nichols here as well maybe he goes there maybe he doesn't Travis Shaw maybe he goes there maybe he doesn't but when was the last time if ever you heard UNC mentioned so prominently in so many top recruiting battles Mac Brown and the staff that he's hired 
They're doing a pretty good job right now. I did not see this coming. This has been pretty impressive all the way around. Let me try to pick up the pace here a little bit because there's a couple other stories I want to get to. So, obviously, new leadership at UCF now, now that former athletic director Danny White has taken the job at Tennessee, and the offer that was once on the table from Florida seemingly has been accepted. Mike Bianchi from the Orlando Sentinel and Orlando Sports Radio reporting this week that Florida and UCF will play one of those two-for-one home-and-home deals coming up in the future where Florida will get two home games, one first, then one in the distant future. And UCF will, I think they call it the bounce house there in Orlando, UCF will get Florida coming in. So I, I think this is a good job by UCF, and I think it's an embarrassment that Danny White wouldn't accept this offer, that somehow he wanted the the ease of, hey, we'll claim a national championship without actually ever having to beat any real teams to do so. He really didn't want the two-for-one offer that, that Florida you know wanted to extend here. Uh, essentially acting like the UCF and Florida were on the same level with each other. I'm an ultimate Gator hater, but obviously we'd laugh at the idea that a group of five team like UCF, no matter how many national championships they claim, might be on the same plane as Florida when it comes to football. So now White is gone and UCF's making the decision they should have made all along. I'm also going to give a little credit to Florida on this too. And you know I don't like doing that, begrudgingly giving this credit to uh, Florida in that they don't have to do this, right? I mean, if Florida never played UCF, I don't think anybody would say they were under obligation to do that. But you sort of get the sense they're doing this because some people in the state, maybe even some of their own fans, probably even some of their own fans, kind of want them to. I don't believe there are tons of UCF fans, but the ones that do exist are probably pretty mouthy. And I think there's some Florida fans who would like to shut them up, and so therefore their athletic department is kind of giving them what they want on this. It's probably somewhat good for college football to have these two in-state teams playing each other. So the fact that Florida is seemingly going to do this, I think it's probably a pretty good thing all the way around. I thought there was an interesting story in the Jackson Clarion Ledger about Lane Kiffin, about how much he's changed since uh, he was the brash guy as Tennessee coach and kind of what he learned at FAU and uh, Blake Topmeyer's the writer. It's a really good story. You should read it. I'll, I'll, I'll try to put a link to this when I post the show later on. But the big takeaway is that, that Kiffin's kind of more than the guy that you see on Twitter. This is one of those things I want you to pay very close attention to next week at SEC Media Days because I don't think there's a bigger divide anywhere between how a guy is perceived on social media versus how he actually behaves in real life than Lane Kiffin, uh, his Twitter personality compared to his real-life personality. I think a lot of folks expect next week at SEC Media Days for Kiffin to be one of the stars of the event. I'm simply telling you that's not going to be the case. Kiffin is not that kind of dynamic personality in real life. He is and this is going to sound more disparaging than I intend for it to, he's a real-life keyboard warrior. I mean, he's one of these guys that really does have a lot more bass in his voice when he's typing into a phone than he has when he's actually performing in real life. And I think next week at SEC Media Days is going to be an example of that. I don't hate Kiffin. I like him as a play caller. I think he's less than when it comes to head coach in comparison to the you know, the top guys in this league. I don't think he quite comes across as senatorial as I'd like for a head coach to come across. And I think we may see an example of that uh, this week there at SEC Media Days. I'll also mention a couple of other stories here real quick. I saw where Brent Venables, the Clemson defensive coordinator, has signed an extension to remain with the Tigers. Amazing that, you know, I mean, you talk about, you know, Clemson and its success and why it's remained a national power for as long as it has – the 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 presence of a guy like Venables not leaving to go take a head coaching job, being content to coach that side of the ball there for the Tigers is a big reason why on that. And obviously, Venables will be a big name that we think a lot about as we head towards the upcoming season. And then finally, uh, a little bit of a shout-out to former uh, Georgia wide receiver J.J. Holloman, who had been at FIU, but it was announced yesterday on Twitter, it was reported that Holloman is now on his way with Hugh Freeze at Liberty this upcoming season, catching passes from Malik Willis. We're already one of the more dynamic offenses in college football. The Flames get a little bit better with the arrival of uh, Holloman. How a player could end up going from FIU to, to Liberty, I guess, is uh, something for other people to kind of consider about you know what may have gone on that led him into the transfer portal on that. But either way, I plan on watching Liberty a lot this season and having Holloman there only makes that more interesting for me. I'm actually kind of excited about this all the way around. So uh, good for Holloman finding a new home, and we'll certainly wish him well as he plays on what's going to be one of the more dynamic offenses in all of college football with the Flames here this season. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the program. And as we say goodbye to you here today, always uh, great to wrap things up in style with a 
Gator Hater Roll Call. Our golden shoe this week has been decidedly of the variety version, you know, not necessarily, you know, true gator hating credentials necessarily. But let's go ahead and give you some some true old school gator hating golden shoe stuff today. And no better person to step up and claim that than our buddy Mad Dog, who says, as his caption, when you're working on your grilled gator recipe for this October and you see Kirby Smart there with the gator being seasoned up there on the uh, cooking surface, uh, pretty interesting stuff from Mad Dog. Uh, very entertaining all the way around. Mad Dog, congratulations to you. You are our golden shoe winner for today. And speaking of those lousy, stinking gators, how about our Gator Hater Countdown? In 106 days, dogs go back to Jacksonville. They get a win over the lousy, stinking gators. We can't wait to see that happen. We'll talk to you Monday, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger. Have a great weekend, everybody. And on video, time now for our R.S. Andrews cool down. Of course, R.S. Andrews is the one to trust for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs this time of year. Of course, you're thinking very much about uh, that air conditioning unit, worried that your tired old system might not be able to make it through the summer that's still on its way. And the hottest weather of the year is still yet to come here for this summer. So go ahead and get the peace of mind you need. Get your system tuned back up to factory fresh specs. Find them online at rsandrews.com for a lot more on that. All right, we'll take your comments. I believe I started on YouTube first yesterday. I'll do some Facebook comments right now. We're not going to go real long today. Um, and I will kind of apologize. I know some of the Jeff audio is a little bit wonky. This is one of those things that drives me crazy because, you know, on on the uh, computer where I edited the audio, it sounded great. Um, on the phone yesterday with Jeff uh, speaking, it sounded fine there. Sometimes this stuff just downloads weird, and there's just nothing else you can do about that. So if that was wonky, I certainly apologize for that. Uh, but nonetheless, let me pop over here. Uh, by the way, Michael Morrow uh, breaking uh, his alias here. Michael Morrow is the great mad dog on Twitter, and uh, he joins the Facebook comment section to celebrate his golden shoe win. Brian Burnett says, just haters over here on Facebook. Who's hating? Uh, Brandon Griffin checking in from Colorado. Brandon, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Uh, is Cody Ledoux on Facebook causing trouble? Oh, Lord, Cody. Uh, Epic Robinson celebrating Tennille Calvino's removal from Facebook jail. Tennille, I'm glad to have you over here. Uh, Matt Rukavina said, did I see that Clemson was given a 27% chance of winning. Is it the national championship? I mean, the one thing you got to understand about those percentages that are attached to FBI, um, obviously a huge part of that is based on the path that would be traveled to get there. So, you know, any non-Alabama SEC teams' percentage chances of winning are going to be much lower given where they have to come from. This is the one thing that a lot of people pretend to ignore when it comes to these preseason evaluations. So if you see Georgia only has – this – Matt, maybe I believe what you're talking about here. If you see Georgia only having a 4% chance of winning the national championship, that's based on the teams it has to play to get there. Obviously a tougher trek through the SEC. Uh, he says, no, it's a 72% chance. He transposed the numbers. A 72% chance of, uh, of beating UGA in the season opener. I mean, if that's true, and this is where like my math skills fail me a little bit, 72% is a lot higher than the current point spread would suggest. Um, you know, and this is one of those things, not to get too deep in the weeds, but there's actually a fairly significant weight attached to when a three-point favorite goes to three and a half and certainly to four, that you would think, well, that higher point spread makes it more likely the underdog may cover. But actually, there's a little bit of a track record in Vegas that once you go above the what's called a key number of three, once you have enough confidence to go above the key number of three, that team actually covers more than 50% of the time because there's a strong perception that they are just the better team, and that seems to carry some weight. So it has been somewhat interesting to me during the offseason that you've commonly seen Clemson not just listed as a three-point favorite against Georgia, but in many situations, a lot of the betting houses have them as a three-and-a-half or four-point favorite there in that situation. So there is – from the betting markets right now, a fairly high degree, high level of confidence in in Clemson. 72%, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I, I expect the game to be much closer than that. But uh, but it's pretty interesting. So I guess Cody is over. Yeah, there's Cody on Facebook. Cody uh, traveling in enemy territory today. Uh, he says, uh, keep that portal chortle button in mind, Randy Hall says. And I'm always happy to have Randy's... Uh, insight here cody also says he never causes trouble with the laughing emoji 
Cody's actually doing double duty. Uh, uh, I don't want to say trolling necessarily because I don't really think he's trolling. But not only is he a Bama fan talking to Georgia fans, he's also a YouTube guy talking to Facebook. So that's so he's got double duty here. Nick Roundtree says ESPN is a dumpster inferno. They are still showing reruns of college baseball and basketball games. Uh, it's time to get ready for football. So I, mean, I will say this, that the the SEC network takeover this year was a total dud. I mean, not that – I mean, I, I like other sports, right? I mean, I, I don't I don't mind them. But, you know, the there was nothing about these takeovers that was in any way, you know, distinguished from, like, what a normal filler programming would be. It's like you flip over there and it's like, you know, some random softball game from May. It's like, you know, if you're going to hype up the takeover, then – People want to see all time great games. They want to see, you know, they, they want to see classic, you know, contests. And yes, I mean, I'll be football centric here and admit they want to see football games. Uh, so, I mean, I was not a fan of the SEC Network takeover this year. I thought it was kind of a dud. Which is not to say that, um, you know, I don't like the other sports, things like that. I, I try to follow all the other sports as much as I possibly can. But when you talk about, you know, hey, your favorite school's taking over the SEC Network, there's a certain level of expectation and i don't quite believe the sec network met and as far as the rest of the kind of uh dumpster fire of espn i mean the the forced retabulation of the football power index numbers i still don't think espn's gotten enough criticism for just how bad that looks because you can go back and like google this and no you probably don't care so you're not going to which is certainly your prerogative but after their original FPI uh, numbers came out, they had Mississippi State at number eight. Not only did they post them without shame, their analytics dudes went around like the sports radio sphere and the and the you know they they were they were campaigning on these numbers. I mean, they were going out there trying to explain just how it was that uh, Mississippi State was number eight. You had every reply guy on Twitter saying this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Come to find out, it literally was the dumbest thing anybody had ever seen because when they retabulated them, Mississippi State fell to number twenty four. Now they weren't the only one to fall, but in the SEC, they're the kind of the only ones we care about. So for the crowd, and I'm not necessarily this guy. I, I told you the other day I care about analytics less than I used to, but I'm not one of those guys that necessarily shouts to the computer screen watch the game nerd but if you are one of those guys that says watch the game nerd to the math people boy you look like a big winner today and the uh the 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 math guys don't do not look quite so strong admittedly um travis mccullough going after our buddy shelton tucker that's always fun to see let me pop over to youtube here for a minute there as well find out what folks have going on over there uh hope everybody's doing good getting ready for a fun weekend and getting ready for some good stuff all the way around. Tanil Calvino uh, over here on the uh, YouTube side of things. So yeah, Tanil got her Facebook status back and is, uh, it, that's actually kind of a power move, right? It's like if, if you get suspended for Facebook and I have no idea why she got suspended, I kind of don't even want to know. But um, if you get suspended from Facebook and uh, once you get your status back, if you migrate over YouTube anyway, uh, that's kind of a power move. That's breaking up with them before they can break up with you. I'm going to give Danielle some credit for that. Uh, all right, let's see what else is going on here. Michael Porter checking in to say go dogs. Danielle talking about the fog burning off in California. It is kind of amazing. I was in San Francisco one time, and, uh, you know, it's like it can be so foggy. Obviously, that's why they have, like, the foghorn, you know, sound at the sporting events and things like that because it can be so foggy. And then you like it, you like you can't even see the Golden Gate Bridge, and then all of a sudden it does just kind of burn off, and all of a sudden it's beautiful. But there are times when you just can't see anything out there. William Perry checking in to give us a go, dogs. Cody Ledoux working double time in both comment sections. Jay Shipes checking in there as well. Let's see what. Let's see if I can scroll up and find anything else. Foster Moss said I had too many cans of the finished long drink last night. Uh no. Uh, I'm curious what what caused that to take place, that comment to take place. But I'm I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Um. Uh, Chino Calvino on the subject of the soft opening. Um. Cody Ledoux says Tyler Booker might commit to Alabama today. I guess we'll keep our eyes on that there as well. Um. Jeremy Barber checking in to give you a go dogs there too. So are we not so are we not live on YouTube right now? Um 
maybe I'm missing something here. We are. Um, so I guess maybe we had a little bit of a YouTube issue. Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Jermaine, I guess I'm just figuring this out. I guess we had a little bit of a YouTube issue today. I'm not sure what happened with that. That's not good. Boy, I tell you what, it's always something, isn't it? Um, so there you go. Always something. Uh, but uh, that is that. So for those of you who may have migrated over here to Facebook because of the YouTube thing, uh, we'll get that fixed for you and, and get the show up there. Uh, Colby, I'm sorry about that. Uh, very, very sorry about that all the way around. Uh, we'll get that fixed. We'll get the whole show uh, posted there. So uh, that's very, very disappointing. I'm very, very sorry to uh, to say that. So let me take a few. Uh, um, he said Bill Sanders says uh, YouTube crashed. So let me um, let me do a few more comments over here on Facebook. And we'll get ready to bounce out. Uh, <laughs> Big Robinson still uh, likes to talk about Bill Bender, which I think is really funny. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, Jimmy Durham says, am I going to Hoover next week? Yeah, so I'll be in Hoover on Tuesday afternoon and then there on Wednesday. The Georgia Day is actually Tuesday, but I'm basically going to do SEC Country Live from there on Wednesday. So what we're going to do is we're going to collect a lot of the stuff from the first few days of SEC Media Days. We'll have that for you live for uh, SEC Media Days. I'm sorry, for SEC Country Live there on Wednesday. And, of course, a lot of coverage uh, for uh, dognation.com for the entire event. So I will be there for part of it next week there in Hoover. Daniel Aldrich says everybody's chippy today. Yeah, you can tell the season's getting close. People are starting to get a little edgy. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, to restate, we will be in SEC Media Days for next week. I'll be there. Uh, we'll do Dog Nation Daily there Wednesday morning, and we'll do SEC Country Live there Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday afternoon. So the the show on Wednesday, Dog Nation Daily, will be really fun because it'll be a big look back on everything that Georgia had going on the day before. So that'll actually be really good. We'll collect a lot of that stuff on Tuesday. We'll present it for you there on Wednesday. So I'm actually really looking forward to that. All right. Um, anything else? Jacob O'Neill said Tennessee's SEC takeover. They only showed the spring game for football. That's that's about what it is these days, right? That's about the only thing you can show, right? Um, anything else before we go? All right, really fun stuff. Thanks for being here, especially on the Facebook side of things. Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. Y'all check out RS Andrews online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They'll get you tuned back up to factory fresh specs and all of that. Also, make sure you check out the Atlanta Journal-Constitution online at AJC.com. Uh, obviously, a lot going on to um, uh, to, uh, to check in on everything happening around the uh, city of Atlanta there. For those of you that have summer travel, it's important to note the AJC's got a good update on this. I-16, the the highway that connects 75 to, to Savannah, is shut down because of a bridge issue over there. So... There's a lot of detour. I mean, when I go to St. Simons or Amelia Island, a place like that, I mean, I-16 is my highway. Um, I, I like it because there's less traffic on it than 75 usually, even if it's kind of a desolate road sometimes. Uh, but 16 is kind of my highway, but it is closed right now, at least in one portion of it. So uh, go to Atlanta Journal AJC.com to get some update on that. Also, some always great updates on all the fun happening this weekend around the city of Atlanta. You can check that out online at AJC.com. And uh, Braves make a trade yesterday, bringing in Jock Peterson. So they begin their second half. I'm going to use air quotes here, run. I guess it's a um, little bit of a, of a you know, live rehearsal, dress rehearsal to see if, uh, George, uh, if the Braves really can be contenders enough to not be sellers at the upcoming trade deadline so updates on all of that atlanta journal constitution ajc.com also did y'all see the tweet from trey young uh trey kind of putting usa basketball on blast if people still say that phrase uh for not making him one of the olympians so uh i'm sure there'll no doubt be all kinds of chatter about that in the pages of ajc.com there as well so check out the atlanta journal constitution ajc.com we'll see you back here monday dog nation daily presented by kroger and we'll get the show up on youtube there as well we'll talk to you then everybody for more Dog Nation videos, check out YouTube.com slash Dog Nation.